On today's episode of the Pats Podcast, we have Stefan here talking about ACL return to play. Stick around. Let's be better athletic trainers. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Stefan, thank you for taking time out of your schedule today. Thank you guys for having me on. No, I greatly appreciate it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, like where you went to school, what you're doing right now? I know there's a big change from your uh, article and uh, how you got interested in the topic of ACL return to, uh, return to activity. Absolutely. Um, I was born and raised on the East Coast in the state of Virginia. Um, I went to undergraduate at James Madison University, where I received my athletic training certification. From there, I got my master's at the University of Virginia, um, and that's where I kind of fell in love with the kind of research aspect, Um, identifying a problem in the clinical setting and then developing methods and strategies to answer that problem. And so from there, I decided to kind of continue my studies at the University of Virginia, where I pursued a PhD. Um, After that concluded in 2020, just peak pandemic, I made the move west to the University of Colorado, where I underwent a postdoctoral fellowship, kind of studying muscle morphology, um, understanding a little more of how our muscles kind of respond with aging and injury. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, like you said, very recently, I um, accepted a faculty position at the University of Utah, where I will be doing very similar research and educating within their um, Masters of Athletic Training program. Awesome, awesome. Well, awesome. congratulations on the uh, the promotion or the the new job title. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. That's amazing. Uh, we talked a little bit offline. Utah is uh, an amazing state. I think you'll really enjoy yourself there. But um, yeah, so let's let's jump into the article a little bit. So I found this article in the Journal of Athletic Training as I was, um, uh, you know, kind of skimming through and seeing what articles that really caught my eye, and this one did mainly because I, I work with a lot of ACL patients, right? Mm-hmm. So um, unfortunately, you know, I don't think we know. I mean, I think we have some theories on why we see so many ACLs, but um, I'm curious, you know, this study was specifically about like return to activity. Um, mm-hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit about the study? You know, what were your methods? Who were, who was the participants in the study? Uh, maybe some inclusion criteria, stuff like that. Just break yeah. it down for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this research was performed at the University of Virginia, um, and we had an excellent collaboration with our orthopedic surgery department where every participant or every athlete or every patient that they saw that underwent ACL reconstruction, they would come into our lab around this time point of them returning back to activity. And I think um, the time point within the cohort in our study, it was right under seven months. Okay. So this isn't when these patients were getting back to activity or being fully cleared, but it was kind of right when they were finishing their um, rehabilitation, their physical therapy, their kind of supervision of an athletic trainer. And then they would come into our lab to be kind of assessed in a battery of musculoskeletal assessments. Um, so these patients, um, all of them had ACL reconstruction. Some had some meniscal involvement in there, but any other big ligamentous problems that approached any other surgical complications Um, those participants were excluded from the study. Um, So we had, I think, just under, or we had, I think, over 300 individuals that came into our lab, got this assessment. And this assessment, it consisted of um, quadriceps and hamstring strength assessments. We had single leg hopping assessments. We had a drop landing assessment where we dropped um, from a 30 centimeter box and they jumped up as high as they could. And from with that, we kind of look at how their knees are moving both from the frontal and sagittal plane um, during this movement. And then we have a lot of kind of patient reported questionnaires to kind of quantify um, how these patients are feeling getting back to sport. And so this 
study, it was a uh, long going collaboration with orthopedics, but our end goal was to see, all right, after we take these assessments, where do these patients go? Where do these athletes go? How successful are they? And so with just under 200 of these patients, um, we followed up with them, whether that be them coming back into the clinic, we called them on the phone, we sent out a questionnaire and we asked them questions of, all right, after you saw us, were you able to return back to your previous level of sport? So what was that sport? Um, and did you have a secondary injury, whether it be on that ACL reconstructed limb or that contralateral ACL? So that's kind of like the methodology or the framework of how we approach this problem and here, how we carried out the study. Yeah. Um, do you have any data on the, the demographics, like age? Was there any age caps on it? Yeah. So it, we definitely, um, if you kind of think about ACL injuries in general, is definitely swayed to the younger um, population. Um, I believe I'm going to have to look back and talk, yeah. I think we are right under 20. So okay. this was okay. a very young, yep. and then we also categorize activity level from this okay. questionnaire called the Tegner, and we were seven or eight out of 10. So this was a very young, a very highly active cohort that we recruited for this study. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that was my next question. Just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you you, kept, you mentioned returned activity at, a, at yes. a prior level of activity, you know, just curious what the demographics of that was, you know, like how much activity were they doing prior to their, their surgery? So yeah, that's mm -hmm. helpful. Um, yeah. So, you know, based off of that study then, you know, so you, you basically took a group of people that had ACLs, you did a bunch of testing around six, seven months to, and, and again, that was at the end of the rehab. Um, and then we, based off of those results, you followed up with them again and again to figure out where, where you're at. Um, Correct. Talk to, talk to us about what you found. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so of the, I think just around 190 we were able to get follow-up information from um, 155 of those participants re reported returning back to activity which was great that was around like an 80 percent success rate if you will um, of these participants reporting getting back to activity so we thought this to be very positive and this kind of um, mirrored the other research that was going along um, going on in this literature um, however, when we looked at those individuals that returned back to activity, we saw an extremely high re-injury rate where we saw 24%. Um, so just about one in five individuals reported having a secondary ACL injury um, on that chondrolateral limb or that ACL reconstructed graft. So on either limb, we one in four individuals reported having a secondary injury. And where again, this wasn't anything groundbreaking. These very high rates have been reported within the literature before, but um, it's still shocking. You know, we don't, this is a very serious injury that these individuals are going through. They're having to be pulled out of their sport, out of their activity for a really long time. And then when we work with them to get them back and we see, um, yeah, one in four individuals are having a secondary injury. Um, it's pretty sad. And then yeah. so the next part of this was to say, okay, not only what are the rates of re-injury, but from that six month, from that eight month uh, return to activity um, assessment, could we identi identify certain tests that predicted yeah. those individuals to have a secondary injury? Because that's where the clinical utility of this lies. And what we found um, actually was completely against our hypothesis. <laughs> um, we wanted, we hypothesized that individuals with weaker quadriceps that weren't functioning very well, um, they were the ones that were going to go on and have a secondary injury. Yeah. Um, however, the exact opposite was found. Um, <laughs> so when controlling for age, for sex, and for activity level, we controlled for those three variables in all of our analyses. Um, what we found is we found that a, a more symmetric quadriceps so a limb symmetry index comparing quadriceps strength on their involved limb to their healthy contralateral limb. So the higher their limb symmetry index actually increased their likelihood of re-injury. And this... So, so that blew my mind. I had, I had to, to yeah, I had to reread that like four times. I'm like, is this actually saying what I think it says? I thought maybe I misread it, right? So you are saying that the, the stronger or more symmetrical the quadriceps strength you found had a predictive to more likely to, to re-injure. 
<laughs> yes, that's okay. what we saw. So within the entire cohort, the 155 individuals, the more symmetric our quadriceps were, increased the likelihood okay. of re-injury. So obviously, it, I don't so, think your research yeah, we, dove into why that was, right? Any anecdotal reasons? Yeah. Like what, what, what did yeah. your group think? Like why do we think that happened? Yeah, so we have, like a, we have a couple of things, and then we kind of dove into this a little bit more, which I'll elaborate on. But okay. first, um, this was a clinical study. So – these individuals, they're coming into our lab, they're completing this battery of assessments, and we are making a nice little PDF report of how they're functioning. And so not only are we using this data for our research, but we're giving this report to the patient, we're giving it to their athletic trainer, we're giving it to their orthopedic surgeon. So their clinical providers are managing how these patients are returning back from this report. And so it's very easy to see that maybe a surgeon, maybe an athletic trainer sees this and they see that, okay, our quadriceps are strong. They're very symmetrical. Let's accelerate our, our progression or let's get this individual back to activity a little faster. So that could obviously bias our results here a little bit. Um, however, we took our kind of study uh, one step further. Um, so within that 155 individuals that returned back to activity, we stratified them just on the median time or the middle time that it took for them to get back. So, and that was eight months. So individuals that returned back to sport for eight months, we just termed early return to activity. And individuals after eight months, we termed delayed. Yes, so it's just before or after that eight months time point. And then what we did is we just re-ran the analyses. And so within that early group, these individuals that returned back to activity before six months, we saw the same result hold true, that a more symmetrical quadriceps, more symmetrical single leg hopping, um, a higher subjective function on our patient reported outcomes, all of those which are good things, which we want, right. they increase the likelihood of re-injury. But what we didn't see is within this delayed cohort, these individuals that returned back to activity after eight months, so after eight months, we didn't see that come out. Rather, we saw that every month that was delayed for return to activity um, reduced the likelihood of re-injury by 28%. And so okay. by us just getting very drastic results on this component of time or stratifying our cohort, um, this really does bring in the question of not only do we need to care and measure and make our decisions from these musculoskeletal assessments, but there's a very strong component of time that it um, – for these patients to get back to activity that we need to consider as clinicians. Okay, so I'm curious with that, um, the like kind of um, early return and then the after eight months return, yes, sir. You, you saw that, okay, so that we, we started to see every month we got a, a better result that we waited. Was that with both sets of groups that had, you know, symmetrical limb strength and mm -hmm. asymmetrical limb strength? Was there any difference between those two groups after, if, if they both, you know, you took the same, do you understand what I'm saying? I am, yes. Okay. So before six months, we saw the um, a significant predictor of re-injury being a quadriceps limb symmetry. After eight months, we didn't see that come out. Okay. Um, quadriceps limb symmetry was no longer a predictor of re-injury. Yeah. Um, rather, it was time. Um, so this kind of goes, and that's and that's a good thing. So that's what this is saying is that if we wait until after eight months to interpret this result. We're not seeing these um, predict or these measures of musculoskeletal function predict re-injury. Um, so yes, there is a balance here that we need to consider as clinicians: is not only how we're administering these tests, but when we are. Um, and you didn't you didn't re-measure the tests at after the eight month period to kind of see if there was another difference or no? Yeah. So no, we only have one follow-up time point within yeah. this cohort, which is, or, yeah, is tough. And that was just kind of asking, did they re-injure or not? Yeah. So, but we did have a range of individuals um, that completed their return to activity assessment ranging from five to, I think, to like 12 months. And so from that, we were able to kind of stratify our cohort. And that's where we found that middle time point of eight months everybody before and everybody after yeah so just to make sure i, I clarify and i understand mm -hmm. doesn't regardless of the test results at six months if you wait past the eight months we're still in better shape regardless of what you look like at six correct 
Cool. Correct. So not just, I mean, there were patients that were stronger before six months, but that increased their likelihood of re-injury. Yeah. So and, that's and what we're seeing come out. Kind of thinking through it, like what you said was, you know, thinking that maybe that just accelerated the return because they felt more comfortable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This is a very yeah. clinical study. So the data that we're using is obviously biasing our patient outcomes and how they're getting back. Yeah. Yeah. Phil, what do you got? So I want to know what happened with the group that didn't have uh, symmetric muscle uh, strength. Yes. So one is that we saw, so this is everybody going back to, together. I mean, we saw them have a lower, um, it was a lower predictor to return back to activity. And then also a lower predictor or a strong predictor of not re-injuring, which is good. But kind of like we, <laughs> what we just talked about is that these patients might have a lower exposure, right? That maybe they're not going back to as many practices, as many games, as much activity bouts, or maybe the intensity is a little lower. And that's stuff to really, that is really, really difficult to quantify yeah. as a clinical researcher is not just are they getting back, but how are they getting back? What are they being exposed to in regards to the demand of their activity? Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing with, with yeah. a lot of, I, I used to deep dive a lot into the functional movement screening, yes. uh, right? So you don't, you can't, there's no way to know the exposure, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe you move really bad, but don't play your bench warmer, right? Yes. That'll, yeah. that'll influence your, your outcomes for sure. So no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, my, my thought kind of goes back to a little bit of revascularization of, uh, mm. the, um, of the graph. And yes, I'm, yes. I'm kind of blanking on when, when that curve goes back to the revascularization at what time period and wonder where your research fits in with that. I don't know yeah, if you Yeah, so that's a really good that point. Um, and there was actually, there's an article that came out, I think a couple years um, ago, um, authored by Tim Hewitt. Um, mm -hmm. And he proposed waiting until two years for these patients to return back to it activity just from that, the revascularization of the ligament and how we see that process happen up to two years, okay. where obviously this was more of kind of just a thought provoking kind of question, but there's a lot of components that we have to go into this. And so I think the profession has kind of shifted a little bit. And if we think back a couple decades, um, all return to activities, um, guidelines were just on time, right? We set a yep. time point, no matter how you looked, if you reached that time point, you were good to go back. And then we shifted to, all right, let's measure everything and let's get these individuals functioning really well and get them back early. Um, you wouldn't believe the amount of patients that come into our lab. It's like, well, Adrian Peterson got back to sport in four months. And it's like, <laughs> okay, well, I assure you that not everybody coming in here is, um, has a functional uh, capacity of Adrian Peterson. But yeah, what we saw from this kind of study is that there's probably a balance between that. And Phil, just like what you said is little components of the revascularization, the healing. Our body does have to take um, a tendon, a separate um, body tissue and incorporate that as a ligament. Um, that has to take time. So it's really balancing how that individual looks, how they're functioning and a time for the body to heal for it to do its thing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, based off of your prior research and, and maybe this study as well, but you know, if you had to boil it down to a few um, predictive mm. tests, which tests would you pick and when would you perform them? And maybe it's more than once, maybe it's at six months, maybe it's nine months, maybe it's at 12. I don't know. What do you, what are your Absolutely. thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to answer that second part first is that serial assessments are so important. Not only can it tell us how much the patient is improving over about a time, but we can see what's working and what's not. If, as a clinician, if we're administering a certain set of tests and we don't see any or a certain amount of, yeah, therapies and we don't see anything improving, maybe we shift to something else. So, serial, um, big advocate for serial assessments. Um, but what we're seeing here is that we shouldn't use these tests, this battery of tests. Um, to make the decision of returning to sport prior to eight months. Okay. So I don't know if I'm advocating, all right, let's wait until eight months to do this test. Complete as many as you can. Really get objective measures, track to see how these patients are doing. But if we are using it 
to make the decision of returning individuals back to activity prior to eight months, we should probably approach that with a little caution. Um, and then the first part of the question is, what tests are we doing? I mean, yes, I think it changes, right? And I think this is the beauty of athletic trainers and uh, the clinical mind, but you can think of all the different demands that sports presents. And what we did in this test, we did quadriceps and hamstring strength, we did some single leg hopping and some questionnaires. And that's really like the building blocks of what it takes to get back to sport. However, that is not at all indicative of the activity demands that these athletes, that these patients are gonna be facing once they get back to sport. So I like these tests in regards that they can be comparable to prior tests, they can be comparable across other populations. But I mean, as you get up, um, and you do really well in these tests and you get back to kind of functional assessments, it's incorporating kind of set maybe more agility measures, such as a shuttle run or a T test that's kind of putting a little bit more physical demand um, to these assessments. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, we're talking about the science of mm -hmm. return to play. Right. And I think there's an art to it as well. And absolutely, I, th I think really good clinicians, um, especially if you have the ability to work with the same patient from the beginning to the end of the process, mm -hmm. you get to know the patient, you get to see how they move and you, you, I personally don't necessarily need these exams or these tests to tell me when they're ready to move on. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you yes. see how they move when they're doing every single exercise is a, as an exam for you. Right. It's a test. Like you see them progress, you see them move, how you're moving, how they're running. Um, so yeah, I do think for, you know, the, the doctor or, or somebody who's not seeing them on a daily basis, these tests are really valuable for them, right? Cause they don't have any other objective measures to, to make decisions off of. So I, I, I find their value. Um, but I think for me personally, I don't put a lot of weight in them. I, I'm more of a graded exposure, I think, you know, mm -hmm. like just kind of, okay, I see that you can perform this. Let's move you on to the next progression. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can perform that. Let's do this. And then, you know, you got to build the work capacity, you got to build, there's just so many, and then it becomes just sports or, you know, um, physical preparation, right? Like mm -hmm. you just have to prepare them for their sport. Um, I, I, I guess my, I, now that I'm done ranting about that, <laughs> uh, uh, my question is, you know, any thoughts around like risk to reward? Um, you know, I've actually, I haven't personally, but I know of people who have tried to complete these tests and actually injured the athlete when they did them, right? Yeah. Obviously, I think most, clinicians know like yes their patient can probably handle it or not but mm -hmm. any thoughts around that that risk to reward of, of doing these tests too early yeah no i think that's a really good question too um we try to stage it um we try to do a little more forgiving tests first and if these patients aren't performing well or if they're not confident with that we kind of halt the exam right there but the whole point of risk reward especially not just returning to activity early but doing these tests early is yeah, increasing the risk for re-injury. And I think it's really tough for me as a researcher to sit here and say like, all right, you need to re reach this number in your quadriceps strength or your symmetry, or you need to be this far out in your time because every patient is different, right? Um, we could have a senior trying to get back to senior day to like make yeah. one final appearance. We might have um, an athlete finishing up a scholarship or just all these different scenarios that approach. And so I think that I like the question and how you worded it is like there, it's a risk reward. And I don't know if an answer is, can fully encapsulate what we want, but it's a discussion worth having with the patient, the athletic trainer, the parents, the doctor, the entire team involved. That's kind of a discussion we need to have when returning these patients back to activity. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, awesome. No, I think it, it, it does. It has to encompass everything. Like you said, mm -hmm. even the parents, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a financial burden, first of all, Absolutely. and then it's, it's time consuming, right? So mm -hmm. like making the wrong decision is, is life changing, right? Mm -hmm. like this is a life changing injury. Um, and, and we need to do everything in our power to, to make sure that the outcomes are, are positive for our athletes. Um, mm -hmm. um, I appreciate the study. This is, this is, um, you know, adding to the, the, the repertoire of, of what we know and how to get athletes safely back to activity. So, mm -hmm. Phil, what other thoughts you got? I, I, I think I'm on a second what you said. That was um, definitely a shocking outcome and definitely gives a little <laughs> bit more fuel to really think about um, treating our athletes as individuals and taking into all accounts um, when we're returning mm -hmm. back to play. Yeah. So, Stefan, I got, um, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot here and say, you know, if you had a son or daughter and they were the ones that were injured, you know, what, what, 
how would you do it? What, what, what exams would you use? When would you put them, you know, when you, mm -hmm. when would you put them through it? And, you know, are you, are you making them wait 12 months? Are you making them wait eight months? What, you know, give, yeah. me, give me your, give me your thoughts as a, as a, as a parent. Wow. Yeah. This is a kind of a tough, <laughs> tough, tough question here. Um, but no, I think, I mean, what we're doing, we're not as athletic trainers, as a profession, we're not doing things wrong. Right. right. So it's kind of taking this, but it's, incrementally assessing them throughout the rehabilitation process, throughout this return to sport progression to see, all right, are we hitting our milestones? And once we are, once we get quadriceps strength to a certain level that we can start comparing symmetry, all right, let's move on to more functional tests. Um, once we start looking good on little more basic components of single leg hopping or a drop landing, now we can bring in some more kind of functional agility measures. Can we throw in some aspects of sport? Um, not a distraction of a sense, but yeah, bringing in. And when these athletes are going back to sport, their mind is everywhere. They're looking at other players that ball. They're not stuck in a laboratory setting. So if I had a son or daughter, yeah, I would use these same tests that we do clinically. Um, I would want them to do it serially, maybe two, four, six months following their ACL reconstruction. But we're not going to use these measures. <laughs> We're not going to interpret these for the decision of return to activity before eight months. And that's at a minimum. So from eight months, then these patients, or then my son, my daughter, <laughs> person I've ever seen, they're going to have to be kind of hitting, yeah, these green lights of 90% symmetry and higher. But after eight months, and then we'll kind of yeah. incorporate, the, incorporate them back into that return to sport progression. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I agree. I don't okay. think, you know, okay. definitely not before the eight month mark. Yes, sir. Yes. Prefer the 12 month mark, to be honest I, with you. I, I do. I do. <laughs> you I, know? I gotta, gotta stay true to the, the, what we found in our article. Here, yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I'm with I you. Agree. I'm with you. I, and I tell all my patients that, right? Like it's, um, yes. you know, yeah, we can get you back around eight or nine, but I would prefer you to wait a whole 12 months, but that's unrealistic for most athletes, especially yeah. just for a mental you know, to, to tell them that, that that's yeah. just really mentally tough to, to think that they're going to be away from their sport that mm -hmm. long. So, but that's that same risk reward discussion that we talked yeah. about. That's yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, you know, especially if you, it just, it's, it's a hard conversation for me. I'm, I'm in a D three college setting. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, not very likely to medically wet red shirt. So if they mm -hmm. miss a year, they miss a full year and they're probably yes. not going to get it back. So it, it's a difficult situation, but you know, that's not a reason to not have it and not a reason to put them at a higher risk for injury. So, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, that was great. Um, Phil, anything else to wrap up before we hit the lightning round? I think we're ready for the lightning round. Okay, let's do it. All right. If you're not currently in it, what is your dream job? Who? Um, I'd like to say it's this journey at the University of Utah I'm about to embark on. Um, I'm able to continue on this research that I'm very passionate about with great collaborators. I'm still able to teach and be involved in an athletic training program. Um, and still be surrounded by mountains to get out and explore. So I'm going to have to say this. Yeah, right. no, I think that's the right answer for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, good luck. Good luck on that journey. I think you'll, I think you will enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so while you're in Utah, what are you going to do for fun? <laughs> oh yeah. I like just getting out, getting lost. Um, big skier, big hiker. Ah, nice. Um, yeah. I like to do some backcountry stuff when snow's on the ground in a safe setting. So yeah, just anything to get outside, but also just being physically active. You'll find a Love lot of that, that out Love there that. for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what inspires you? Um, yeah, I think piggybacking off that answer, it's um, being able to promote physically ac active lifestyles. Um, anybody that's involved in any activity, they know that at a certain time point, you are going to get injured. And just because you are injured, I don't believe that should prevent you from doing what you love and what you're passionate about. So... Um, individually, personally in my life, just being active, but also that um, I'm able to do that as my job um, in the research I do. Yeah, it's inspiring. Perfect. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, this last one's a little bit deeper. Um, you know, what, what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, athletic trainer. It's a selfishless act of, yeah, improving one's health. I, I really do. Um, yeah. If you look at athletic trainers in any setting, just the sacrifice, um, the commitment that they, and the time that they serve to promote the health and well-being of other individuals, I don't know if it's paralleled in any other profession. 
Stefan, I think that was like really it. well said. And I don't think people understand that enough, right? That, mm. you know, we get into this profession knowing that it's not the highest paying job and it's long mm. hours, right? Um, so those, if, if you run into an athletic trainer that is really good and that they have been in a position for a really long time, say thank you because they are putting in the hours and they're doing it purely out of the love and joy of treating athletes. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, Stefan, uh, you've been awesome to chat with. I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy day um, and sharing your your expertise with us. Um, if, we, if any of our listeners have any questions for you, any way that they can reach out, either social media or email? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my emails are kind of bouncing between academic <laughs> um, jobs, so I think I'll be able to respond to any of them that you find. But yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm not the most vocal person on there, but I will definitely respond to anything that you reach out. And I think that's just at Stefan Bodkin. So okay. yeah, reach out there and I will happy be happy to communicate. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, Stefan, thank you again. And thank you to Moravian University for sponsoring this episode. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, share, tweet, post, comment, and DM. Until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. And I'm Philip Hensler. And this was the Pats Podcast.